we got another request from one of our patrons. He wants us to uh, discuss a topic about proactivity. Uh, we've mentioned being proactive as um, a multiplier in the, in the workspace for some time now, but we've never really addressed about how to be proactive. And then is it possible that being proactive can actually hurt your operations or your task or your project? Like, how, how is being proactive actually hurtful for you? <laughs> and yeah, or when, when is pro, being proactive uh, sort of reversing proactivity? <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds dumb, right? And a lot of people are like, that's, that's kind of dumb. Like, how, how is that even possible? Like, well, for, for one, right? Most, uh, I, uh, going back to our pre, uh, the first bit of our topics, like, uh, how can, productivity be hurtful to the task it it goes into like when you're trying to be preemptive that's majority of the uh opportunities to be proactive is you're trying to prevent something from happening and this normally happens when you've done a risk assessment you you have the data you have the trend you have the historical to prove that on this time on this event on this type of action the xyz is going to happen we already know this it's been proven time and again that this will happen. So to be preemptive is that if we like if we know X Y Z is going to happen, then we can expect to have th- uh, these kind of resources to mitigate them. This is true. We we know this. But when you when you're trying to prevent an uh, action or an incident or an issue or something from happening, you generally run into other what ifs, right? And these what ifs can skew into more what ifs and it just keeps expanding. And instead of like trying to pick and choose, okay, this, this what if can happen, but it's low risk. It's like a one of it may or may not happen. So instead of weighing that in into your decision-making tree, you just says, well, I want to prevent every single what if. And so we're going to create steps to ensure that these what ifs don't happen. (laughs) Now, but by Hearing this right now, like, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> well, like you said, it's like, it's building a contingency plan, right? You've, you've done your risk assessment. You've got uh, the severity of the impact, right? Be it mm-hmm. uh, to, to the program, to your flight operations, to your personnel, to your assets. Um, and so, like you said, all right, I will, I'm going to be proactive and here's all, here's all the flaws within my program. Awesome. I want to mitigate Every one of those. Well, that's awesome. I commend you on wanting to do that. And that's, uh, it, that's, if you can do it, great. But typically, budgets aren't going to allow for you to mitigate everything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you want to be proactive and prevent all that stuff, but you also got to prioritize severity levels, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so be proactive in, in reducing the, the large dollar item things or the, the most harmful uh, to, to program health and or personnel health, right. Of your people. Hey, if we don't get better training on this piece of equipment, we're going to have employees losing fingers left and right. It mm-hmm. definitely sounds like you should jump on that one versus, Hey, if we don't, uh, if we don't get better energy drinks in the break room, uh, morale is going to go down. Sure. That's, you know, you want to keep morale up and all that too, but losing fingers to, not having the right energy drink there's obviously one you should be more proactive with i think yes morale super going to go down if everybody's walking around with a bunch of nubs <laughs> right my morale will definitely plummet if i'm don't have a hand <laughs> yeah if i'm if i'm missing digits if i'm yes. ham fisting my phone because i don't have any fingies <laughs> little fingies to do any typing you know Is it, why do they call them fingers i don't see them finger <laughs> Yeah, phalanges. <laughs> phalanges. I swear, I heard. I think it was like the Simpsons. I heard them like I've never seen them fing. Like, God damn it! Now, now that's a thing. Finging. Yeah, <laughs> finging. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly right what MVP was saying, right? Like, you you gotta understand what severity level things can occur, and at what likelihood something will occur, and then you can allocate your time and resources and your manpower to that. This goes at every level from the basic mechanic to the guy calling the shots at the, on the line. 
reason for this is because you only have a finite amount of resources and people and people and resources burn out over time. So if you're having one person cover 50 different things in one in one snapshot in time, it's only going to work so much. This causes undue stress to the person doing the task. This causes undue stress for the person scheduling the task. And this causes undue stress for the stuff you're trying to do the task to, right? Like an example of this is right. Um, pre-flighting planes consistently, like being uh, having a perpetual state of readiness. We want this plane pre-flighted every day or every three days just in case it's going to fly, which is, which sounds all right. But, it, you know, with, let's say, like with panels coming on and off, with people looking into places every so often, you think you're being proactive by ensuring that the aircraft is, is flight ready. But all those times of taking things on and off, people crawling in and out of spaces, you're going to induce a fault. Yep. You're good. You're going to in you're going to forget something, you're going to leave something in there or just by you taking things on and off, you're going to induce a failure. If that makes or any sense. Or you might have a special coating, right, that goes over your the skin of your your uh, airframe. Mm-hmm. And every time you do that, you've got to reapply all that special coating or repaint or whatever else and and there you go. I mean, that's added time and money and and resources both in material and uh man hours to to complete the work mm-hmm. just because you're every three days ripping 40 panels off for a, a pre-flight but after the out of the last 12 times that you've kept this thing pre-flighted you only flew once yes at some point you would bring up to your management hey uh maybe this isn't we're spending x amount of dollars and this and that here and that's unfortunately it's the sad way. Uh, a th- sad thing about it is when you bring up kind of issues like this. When I do uh, risk assessment at work, I always have to, to provide a dollar amount and an hour amount mm-hmm. um, with it because nobody at the high levels that make those uh, rectification decisions mm-hmm. care unless there's a dollar amount to it, right? Yes. Um, or at or hours involved, which equates to. The dollars, but it's so when I'm when I'm working with uh, the various departments in my in my program and, and identifying risk and this and that, they'll send them the the risk to me to review. Like, hey, this all looks good. Um, is there a a dollar amount with this? And that being, what's the cost of material, and what is the cost of man hours? Yes. Because when I push this up to the upper management, the upper echelons for review. Uh, the only thing that they're going to focus on as they're as they're going through it is looking for numbers. What's my number value here? What am I going to lose in profits? What am I going to lose in time? What am I going to lose? You know. Yes, absolutely. And this and this applies especially uh, also to like say the military and general aviation. Uh, military, it's the man hours part, and also it turns into a, a little bit of complacency, right? Because you you're wasting the man hours to get a plane ready, and it doesn't fly. And like, and then they say, "Well, pre-flight it again for the for the next go that may potentially happen in the next two or three days." And you go, oh, "Well, I just looked at it like a day ago or twelve hours ago. It's fine. It's not nothing's gonna be wrong with it." And then you're you foster this mentality of complacency where like I just I literally just looked at this. No, nothing could have potentially have gone wrong. And then slowly but surely, more and more standards start to slide, and then. The next time they actually do an in-depth pre-flight, they just skip over a lot of stuff because they're tired of looking at the same thing over and over again. And then that's when you run into real faults. So that preemptive, proactive action that you try to do to prevent a, a, a consequence actually ends up inducing it because you've created, the, created all these extra steps that just add undue pressure and stress to the people doing it. And then you're also inducing a, a sense of complacency because now they feel like they've seen this, this item so many times over that they could almost map it out in their brain how it's supposed to look. And instead of actually looking for what it is, they're just projecting what, they've, what they're thinking onto the actual uh, part. And it ends up skipping over the fault or the issue, if that makes any sort of sense to anybody else. Yeah, so... so- you have to be proactive and, and it's good to be proactive 
no matter what your field of field of work is in, right? Pro, being proactive is going to help you uh, uh, stay on time, oftentimes under budget. Um, it, it just maintains uh, high profitability, essentially. Yes. Um, but but as Six just alluded to, you know, it can it can, it's a it's a double edged sword. Uh, you also know when, need to know when to turn it off. Hey, we're going to maintain this this bird uh, for this this two week period in a flyable uh, pre flighted status uh, because there's a potential it can go, and it's maybe it's for an exercise that's going on, or uh, you're there's a big PGA golf tournament going on, right? So you work in the private jet industry, and it's down in uh, Miami, and so okay, you're gonna you're gonna be proactive, and you're gonna stage uh, extra parts equipment, fluids, whatever in that area, maybe an extra team, um, maintenance team down in that area to service jets as they, as they call them the squawks. Um, but if that, that PGA golf tournament's only going on for a week, um, then, then when that week's done, you need to, to reduce and reallocate your team just by leaving those additional teams down there one team's getting called for the work or one and one team's not. So one team's just sitting around. Yeah. They're getting paid, but they're losing out on per diem. They're losing out on whatever. Cause they're, they're not getting jobs. You know, they're not getting work orders for the day or whatever like that. So, so you got to know when to turn it off as well. Yes. Or, absolutely. or reassess, right? Maybe that's a better way to say it. You are being proactive to the point where, okay, I'm going to pre-stage all this, uh, these personnel and equipment down here just in case. And if it pans out, it pans out, you know, and we keep both teams busy the whole time and glad we stayed on top of this. We, we, we increased profits by 20% by being proactive. But when that, that, that period's over, you got to also recognize that now it's pointless for me to keep these excess tools and personnel down there because there's, there's nothing else going on. Yes, absolutely. There's no, there's no event. Yes. It, this, this reminds me of a time, uh, this is kind of off topic, but still fairly similar, where like uh, you're scheduled to do a work travel day, right? And Or you're expected a work travel team to come to your site and do X, Y, Z to whatever plane. And so you're preemptively understanding like this is priority one. This has to happen. This team needs to be accommodated for their inspections, for their work or whatever the case may be. That has to be number one. All right. Got it. We have these many people staged and ready for when they show up and then stuff happens and your, your operation schedule is very loaded. So yeah, this team is your, your people you have staged is going to be helping team the, that team coming through because they're priority one, but your schedule is so overloaded. You kind of have to task them out because you're shorthanded or the flight schedule is just that heavy, whatever the case may be. And then here comes the work, the, the, the work travel team coming by and say, where's all my people at? I'm priority number one. I'm like, Oh fuck. Where have you guys been? And they, the lead member is there, but all their equipment and their resources to do whatever they have to do is not but they still expect to be priority one. I'm like, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> like you're here. Cool. But what are we going to do? Your, your inspections or your work is nowhere near ready. So instead of just sitting alongside with you until it shows up, why don't we continue on and do other things until your stuff is here? And then we can actually get to working. We're still priority one by all means, but you're not ready to do priority one work. And, this this is kind of an off topic rant for me because I remember so so many times we preemptively staged stuff waiting for a um, a project or a inspection to happen, and then it it it's here but it's not ready. But they still expect to be treated like they're number one. Like I'm sorry, man. Like this kind of goes into your uh, reassessment of priorities and reassessment of tasks. Like I'm not gonna shuffle everybody around due to this he- heavy workload just to sit around and wait for your stuff to show up and then we can get to work. How about we continue on with what you're, what we were doing until you're ready. And then we'll reassess and reorganize as we need to. Yeah. We have B- people B- assigned to your project. However, your project is not ready to start yet due to X, Y, Z factors. Mm-hmm. We have, 
we reallocated those team members to another project until your components, whatever you're waiting for arrives. Mm -hmm. Now, now this is, you know, we're being proactive in keeping you number one. So when X, Y, and Z line up, boom, we're ready to begin. We don't have to go find people to do whatever. We've already got all of the things that we need to support you staged. All we have to do is walk from where we're currently at to where you're at and we can begin. Yes. Um, But, but on, you know, but a lot of people see it as if you're not, if they're not just sitting there waiting to begin, you're, you're not ready. You're not being proactive. You're not being staged. No, it's, I'm being proactive, but if I had people assigned to you and they're just sitting over there because you're not ready to begin, I am, that's where the double edged sword comes in. I am losing out on progress over here mm-hmm. by trying to be proactive on this other pro- program because they're just sitting around waiting on you and your, your things. Yes. Or here, here's another one. I think uh, all the other line mechs can feel this pain. Have you ever been told, uh, we're going to work this weekend to take, to get ahead on the hours for the next week so we can have more lead time for any follow on issues, right? Or we're going to get a head start on the hours so we can have more time off later. Like if that's not the biggest lie I've ever heard in my damn life, <laughs> 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 you know, like, cause what the pre I get the proactive mindset behind that, right? If we work, the, if we do this weekend work, we're going to have m- more time to address any issues on the, as it comes along. And then if we're ahead on hours, then we can use that extra lead time or extra downtime to do e- either more inspections, more maintenance, or just take some time off. But what ends up happening, we plan for the weekend work, but we didn't plan for to have, added support on the weekend because they don't work or they have extra steps to have people there to work. So so we end up coming in, we do whatever little we could. And instead of gaining 25% progress, we only gain like maybe one to 3%. And we ended up staying on track with whatever we plan to do the following week. Anyway, like fantastic. That goes back into evaluating your contingencies, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, we decided we have to work this weekend to get 25% uh, back on the board, you know, mm-hmm. to gain 25%. Cool. All right. Maintainers, you're all going to be here this weekend. We're going to get back on the board. Okay. sounds good. Then you show up like, hey, uh, we need engineering support to go through this mod or whatever. I can't find engineering. Has anybody seen them? No, we haven't seen them. Where, where are they at? You go talk to leadership. Oh, it's probably because we didn't tell them that we were working this weekend. Well, no. why not? Right. If we're working, why isn't, well, we didn't think you needed them. Well, so, so you can be both proactive and counterproductive all in the same breath. If you're not, look, if you're not looking at all aspects of why you're there and what support you'll need. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so it's more than just the maintenance group, right? If you're, if you're running the maintenance shop, you gotta, and you gotta bring that up to leadership as well. Cause half the time they're, I mean, they're not going to be there anyways. So, you know, <laughs> if they're telling you, you got to be there for this, these projects, uh, evaluate what all those projects are and what support you'll need from them. Do you need certain test equipment that's not on site? Do you need uh, do some of your tools at, uh, out of calibration and you'll need those recalibrated prior to this work beginning? Do you need engineering support? Do you need... Um, Supply, <laughs> supply. Oh yeah, ex- exactly. Like, what if what, what if we need to get some packings out of supply? Do we need somebody there that can issue out packings? Like, or or should I pull all these parts ahead of time mm-hmm. and have them staged for for this weekend in case that we do that? Right. And if okay, I've seen that work too. Right. So we're going to save on man hours by not bringing supply in because we've issued out all those parts prior to the weekend work. However. Yeah. You forgot to call engineering. So all the work that you thought was going to get done didn't get done. So now when Monday rolls back around and supplies back in, you got to turn in all those parts to be counted back in supply. So you don't just floating around the hangar. Then to turn around two days later and reissue all of them back out when, mm-hmm. when the test equipment or whatever shows up, like it, you know, Oh, it, yeah. it, it's easy to be uh, proactive and counterproductive all in the same breath. And it's a hard, it's a, it's a, it's a hard line 
to uh, follow because there's just so many what ifs in those in those scenarios. Absolutely. Just make the best decision you can with a call, you know, at the time. Yes. And uh, this kind of goes into the second part of the topic is like, how can being proactive be considered annoying or even ob- obnoxious? Right. And we kind of sort of alluded to that uh, in just in our examples, because whenever you try to be proactive, you're you're identifying that there's there's potentially a problem with something. Right. Or there could be potential holes along the line that we didn't readily foresee in our previous um, um how do you say our previous uh, times doing a certain task or schedule and some people are more enthusiastic than others when they point out like oh i have a plan this is this is how i can be proactive this is how we can um preemptively mitigate these issues before they happen now for all from for the most part it may be good intentions right like this is the problems i see this is the issues i think we're going to run into we should we should address these now the problem is when you're over enthusiastic or you're just not savvy with the audience that you're presenting this to, it could be seen as you're just being an asshole and you're trying to show that how stupid they are. Right. And mm-hmm. we, we ourselves have run into that so many times where we're being sincere with our actions. We're being sincere with our planning, our scheduling and our allocation of resources and people that some individuals with decision making authority find that as a giant fuck you to them that their plan is trash and our plan is better. I'm like that's not at all what I said or not at all what they're saying. It it's just sounding like that to you because of how they came, came up over the table with it. <laughs> yeah. It could have been all in the presentation of it. Right mm-hmm. now. I know, you know, many of your, your bosses uh, will ask you uh, be proactive. Um, look ahead over the next week and what we got coming up for schedule maintenance and plan accordingly. Okay, cool. I can do that. Um, but you, you could also, hey, uh, see where, see where we got some flaws within the program. All right, sounds good. So you go and identify all these, all these flaws, and you put a PowerPoint together, and you bring it up to your leadership, and they, well, we don't have time for that. No, that's stupid. No, we can't afford that. That costs too much. Whatever reason you want to throw out there. And so you bring it up a few more times, right? And each more, each time you get a little saltier and saltier because they tell you they don't have time. But then fast forward three months and all of a sudden, a lot of the things that you, you brought to light are now being resolved, but, but you're not getting the credit for it. No, that's going to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. You brought it up. They said they didn't have time. They were listening to what you said though. They have the PowerPoint. They're looking at it. And then down the road, they bring it up to somebody else. And they get green lighted to implement those changes, those corrections, those fixes, those mitigations, whatever. And um, now they're getting all the the uh, glory for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've said this on several episodes and I'll say it again. Uh, Ronald Reagan had a quote that said, there's nothing man can't accomplish as long as he doesn't mind who gets the credit. So understand that, too, with being proactive, right, uh, and trying to present it to your leadership. Don't go in it for the glory and the I saved the program attitude. Me and me alone was the fix, was the change, was the uh, the golden egg. Um, nine times out of ten, it's it's going to fall on deaf ears mm-hmm. until until it doesn't. Right. And you're not going to be in the room when those decisions are made. Yep. that That's a very interesting point you put up there, too, because uh, sometimes it just depends on who is doing the presenting. Right. Or who's who's a. Uh, pitching the preemptive ideas or proactive ideas like say a regular line man has an idea he thinks it it's great and it actually is great but just if, like the influence this person has may not be um how do i say political enough for people of decision making authority to listen to and it sucks to say that but it happens and then you have like say another person let's say this time uh an engineer has set or has the exact same idea, has the exact same uh, preemptive steps as you, the line mechanic, has pitches the same thing to the people of decision making authority, and they take his word for it. They green light him right off the bat, and you're sitting there wondering, like, what the hell? I said the exact same thing, and where they gave me shit for it, now this person's getting a freaking uh, a round of applause. WTF, right? And it's sad to say it, it kind of boils down to how it's presenting it 
and sometimes who is presenting it. And it could also it could be mostly because of political influence. By political, I'm not talking like like the Senate versus the Supreme Court kind of shit. I'm not I mean like that. I mean like like social politics. Like how is this person seen in the workspace? How is this person yeah. influencing the workplace hierarchy? Yes. How is this person influencing the the workspace? And like MVP said, the workspace hierarchy, like it's sad to say, but it really it, sometimes it does boil down to the workspace politics. Like, who are you and what do you influence? Now, sometimes they'll listen to the line mech or sometimes they'll listen to the technician. But like MVP was saying, like anything can be accomplished if you don't care who gets the credit. So if you have a great ass idea and you have the the data and the written word to back it up, pitch it to your next your next in line your first line supervisor, your first line manager, whoever and say, Hey, here's an idea. Here's a problem. I see a a way to fix it. What do you think? Please pitch this up. Yeah. Let them punch up. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's a great question. You could be an excellent maintainer, but if you're known and do excellent work, your paperwork's legit. But if you're one of those who is constantly complaining, everybody knows you do good work. That's why you're still employed. And so they just put up with your constant complaining or, or bullshitting or, or, bad mouthing, whatever the case is, everybody puts up with it. They know you're a whiner, but they put up with it because your work is exceptional. And so they see that value in you, right? That's why they don't just get rid of you because you are added value from your quality of work. But you could have legit concerns or risks you've identified because you're in it. You're out on the line. You're in the bay. You're, you see it, right? You see it coming. You see that you see what's happening. You're, you're looking at the, TCTOs, your service bulletins, and you seeing flaws within those, and they need to be identified and addressed before asset and people get hurt, damaged, whatever. Um, but because you've got the uh, the the air about you that you're a whiner, everybody just as soon as you start talking, they just turn you off. Mm-hmm. So it's because it, it's a little boy who cried wolf. Ah, this person's always bitching about something. There's you know. Just ignore them. They'll go, they'll, they'll go back to work eventually. <laughs> so that's where it comes into the, you have no political, political power at that point. Nobody's going to care about what you have to say. If, if everything you always say is always negative. So that's like six said, take it to your, take it to your shop lead or your supervisor or whoever that maybe not even them might be somebody above them, right? Maybe you're a product of your environment and they're just as salty as you are. And that's where you learned it. Yep. Take it to the next one up. And who who are a little more tactful in their presentation and delivery and let them make those changes for you. Now yes. you're not going to get credit, but you're going to, you're going to, you're going to get the reward by the end result and those changes being impl- implemented. Yes. Um, but if you went into it for the glory, no, it's not coming for you on that end. Absolutely. Right. Now this is not talking about like, say you see a safety issue over and over again and nobody in your organization is doing something about it. That's a whole different another step. And uh, there's so there's different avenues to approach this. And we can't cover all of that just because some of this involves like federal authorities. It involves like being put on the news. And sometimes it involves like some federal action, you know, like it, it there's steps for things like that. But if for um, things within your organization that affect the day to day or it affects things that, you know, for a fact, it's going to turn into an issue, at least do the due diligence and and understand the political environment that you're in and either a address it in a tactful manner, like figure out how to do that or address it to the, to your next in line and then use that as evidence and and work your way to the top. However, which way that works. Uh, If it has to go outside your organization and just know you have to have all of your ducks in a row, because once, once you step out of that circle, this is, this is going off topic now. Just once you step out of that circle, all your ducks need to be in line because they're, there are going to be entities out there that's going to be poking holes at every inch of your story. So just a little forewarning on that off topic, but I had to say it. <laughs> well, it could be even one of those as you're presenting, um, you know, you're being proactive. You're, you're doing as you were asked, you're identifying uh, risk, you're, um, you're staging, you know, you're prepping for this next big mod period. You're uh, staging for an, the next uh, flight event whatever the case may be, right? You're, you're being proactive about it. You're trying to get 
everything squared away. So when it comes down to it and your time to begin, everything just is moves as one well oiled machine. Um, but you know, you could, you could put forth to leadership, your proactive steps, but you could also identify the downfalls of being proactive. So you could list out all 20 things that you need to, that you're, you're trying to be proactive on. And if you're, if you're not proactive on all those, what are the, what are the pitfalls, right? Mm-hmm. That'll help decision you and your leadership go, okay, all right, cool. You've identified all these things. Well done. Uh, number one, five, seven, and 12 are pretty low level for us, though, if we're being honest. So let's cut those off the board, realign what's left, and start chiseling down and say, okay, from here, let's do these steps. Going in and knowing, right? So you're going in knowing ahead of time what risk you're willing to accept or your leadership was willing to accept. So if for whatever reason those uh, those pitfalls occur, your your leadership is already aware and willing to take the risk rather than coming to you and going, what the hell? Why didn't you bring this up before? Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, like show both of it, right? Come up with a show, find the problems, but also present solutions to those problems. Don't do anybody can find problems all day. Anybody can point out a thousand things wrong where they work any day of the week, but you got to come up with solutions to that. Cause then it goes back to that person who's always just bitching. Yep. Ah, you're just always complaining. There's nothing. You're not, you're not trying to act proactively fix anything. You're just identifying problems and wanting somebody else to do all the work. Yep. Absolutely. All oh, right. This, this part kind of triggered me at, <laughs> right now, but absolutely right. And just understand that as a team member in whatever position you are, whether it just be the brand new tech that just checked in or you're a senior level uh, mechanic who has some kind of decision making authority, understand that there's no way for you to stay out of the politics. <laughs> at, at some point, you have to to dip your feet into it at some point you got to understand the influence of each uh uh hierarchy within the the workspace and just know like what when you fit in and what keywords will jog an action if that makes any sort of sense right and yeah i mean you can um oh what am i trying to say here you're not gonna yeah and you're not gonna say the politics now there are some people that want nothing to do with politics and they just want to just want to come up in, do their job and they do it well. And that's fine. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But also as, you know, as, as a leader, recognize those people that you have in your shop. There are some who want nothing to do with the limelight, but they'll, they'll, they're great and they're excellent workers and they'll help you find problems all day, but have that pulse on them because you're going to have to also, also pull it out of them. They're not going to complain. They're just going to do it. So, yeah. Hey man, what are you noticing? Oh, well, over the last week, I noticed this and this is coming up. Have you seen anything? You know, what have you seen? Uh, you seen any things we need to mitigate come in? Well, actually, yeah, I was thinking if we, if we were going to start this, but do we have this and this and this compo- uh, parts or tools or whatever? Because that'll make our lives so much easier once we begin. Oh, you know what? We only have two of those three things. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to take that and, and punch it up the chain and try to get resolution. Cool. And those people are good with that because they got out there what they needed to say. You're able to get your team what you need and the program gets what it wants for a successful operation. Yeah. But you got to identify, a, identify those people. That's a very good uh, point you made right there, especially because you got those ones, like you said, who just, it, you have to really drag it out of them to understand like what exactly they need. And they may know very well what's going on. They just, they're just so into the grind that they just rather just suck it up than to voice an opinion about it. And we've done that too. <laughs> there are times where we just like, you know what? I'm just going to put my nose to the grindstone and just grind it out. Yep. But it's, it's those ones you really got to pay attention to. Cause they're the ones like they won't realize they're broken until they literally start falling to pieces. So. Well, and like for my own, my own shop, right. We've got guys in there, guys and gals, both, but uh, personnel in there, they're retired military or they were management in another job. They know what it is. They know what it takes to be management. They understand uh, being proactive and, and everything we've been talking about here. Um, But they came to this job because they didn't really, you know, the other one fell apart. They didn't really want to be in management anymore. Being in management, a lot of headache uh, from both the HR side to the programmatic side, to the personnel side, to, 
there's a lot of things. So a lot of, a lot of people are like, Hey, I did it, did my time. You know, I, I it's not for me. I just, I want to be a nose to the grindstone person. I yep. want to show up. I want to do my job. I want to do it well. And I want to go home. Yeah. But those are the, again, those are the people that I talk with a lot. Like, Hey, what do you guys see? What do you think about this? Is this overkill? Is it underkill? Am I not, am I oversimplifying the problem or am, am I not thinking critically enough on it? What am I missing here? And they have a wealth of knowledge because they've been in the industry far longer than I have, right? They're older than me. Mm-hmm. Um, they should be in the leadership role. But again, like I said, they, they don't want it, but they know what it, what it is. They understand it. They see everything from that big picture level, even though they're not in the big picture level position. Yes, absolutely correct. And we, we've, when, when we've seen all those kinds of life and again, like those ones, like uh, if you don't take, if you don't ask them or at least take a moment when keep your, uh, keep a pulse on them, they'll be the ones to grind it out and they'll fall to pieces before your very yep. eyes. And you won't even know it because they're just so um, to the uh, reserved to themselves about it. And I've witnessed that. I've witnessed, I'll come in one day and I'm like, Ooh, something's off. You can, you can just see it. Mm-hmm. It's like they got an aura around them, like pig pen, you know, <laughs> Charlie Brown. He's got that, that dirt cloud around him. He's yep. got this aura around him where they're just, something's bothering me. And you got to pry it out of them. Hey, Hey, what's going on with you today? Nah, nothing. Just, fine i'm just working and i'll let it go for a little bit i'll come up hey man you sure everything's good yeah it's it's fine sure doesn't seem fine but if you say it's fine okay and then they're like i just think it's funny how you know and then that's when they'll finally (laughs) that's when they'll finally unload on you right because they don't they also don't want to just unload on their boss and say everything sucks and everything's fucked but i i can't fix it if i don't know what's wrong because like i told him i said i can't see everything right i'm looking at I'm one person looking at things from my position, but I'm looking at from at I'm a I'm a fifteen thousand foot view of all three parts of what this department does. But you guys are down in it in the weeds on this in this aspect, and these ones are down in it. Bring it to my attention. I can't help you if I don't know. Absolutely. And I apologize. And I always tell them I apologize that I don't know. I, I'll be as proactive as I can, but if I I can only know what I know. And so Absolutely. so once they let me, you know, once they tell me problems or whatever i can i can work towards amending those but uh and being proactive for the team that's why i told the team i said for me to be proactive for you you got to be proactive in letting me know too right open lines of communication because it's a double-edged sword you i can be as proactive as i as i as i can be but i'm I'm gonna miss something it's just inevitable i'm gonna miss something i'm not gonna see it all so help me be proactive by you being proactive and telling me what you're seeing and we can talk about it together and go, you're going, Hey, I see that, you know, we have an excess amount of hardware lying around. Okay. Well, why do we have excess amount of hardware lying around? We don't know. We can't figure it out. You know, we don't know what it belongs to. Nothing's labeled. Oh, we got a problem or whatever. Or it could be one of those, Hey, Oh, you guys weren't aware of this. The program decided to order X amount of additional hardware as free stock over this next mod period, because we know we're going to be stripping 400 screws out just the nature of what the nut plate to the screw is right it's just Mm -hmm. you know so instead of having to wait every other day and ordering individual screws at a time we've just ordered this restock right we can talk about it and say oh shoot we don't understand why this is happening and maybe i i know why or maybe they're telling me that i'm going shoot i don't know why we have that either let's figure it out but i can only be i can only know what i know so help me be proactive by you being proactive and that doesn't work just from from management to personnel it, it, it's teammate to teammate yes and that's exactly that's the key word right there and you said it earlier and i wanted to highlight that is the communication piece right part of being proactive is to communicate your ideas and your and your concerns in such a way that it's easily understood and mutually understood by everybody that it needs to be addressed to please if there's anything y'all have gotten off from this is learn to communicate your issues and learn to communicate in a way that is deemed valuable to everybody right because for us for for people on the line right the value is getting the job done and going the fuck home that's that's very rudimentary and very summarized but for the most part right that's what we do and then for the management levels on up right 
it's not just getting the task, but it's also one task is a is a piece into the overall puzzle, which some people may or may not see in the grand scheme of things. But knowing where we are in this and how we communicate the work, the the process flow helps everyone to stay aligned with what needs to happen and then know where the risks are so we can all allocate the resources correctly instead of just creating undue steps, creating undue stress, and then inventing new ways to do old things or just doing things just, just because like we like the perpetual readiness. We know that's yeah. unsustainable, but we do it. Aviation, anyway. Yeah. Aviation is not, not a new concept. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel on a daily basis. I mean, yeah. maybe another program or another place you've experienced has done something better. Try to get that implemented there. But back to the communication side of things. Um, if if I walk into, you know, the program director's office and go and start the conversation with your program sucks and here's why, that person's mm-hmm. immediately going to go on the defensive and turn off and not listen to whatever you have to say because of the way you approach them, right? They're going to go, oh, oh, oh I, my program sucks because that's a direct reflection of me. Bloop, I'm going to now I'm going to listen to what you're saying and I'm going to give you all the reasons why I think it's successful. Yes. And so you're, you're, you're just having two different conversations now as a leader. Also, like I tell my kids, well, they need to stop saying that. Well, just ignore them. I can't ignore it. Well, fucking learn. You know what I mean? (laughs) Uh, So as a leader, when somebody walks in like, Hey, this sucks. And here's why just ignore that part. And then hear what they have to say. It might be something kind of valid. Now at the end of it, if they brought up just bullshit things, you can be like, dude, Okay, th- thank you. Thank you for bringing those up. I've taken notes of them, uh, and we'll see if the budget allows for rectification. You know, yes. do it tactfully like that. It goes to both sides. You know, learn learn how to address those making uh, the decisions or who you need to get the risk into the ear of. And then on the other side, uh, don't be a big baby back bitch. Don't wear your heart <laughs> on your sleeve. Just be like, okay, yep. I'm sure there's some problems. What do you got? <laughs> and then, and then do that, take notes, assess. And then after you, you know, make that person feel good about what they've done. Cause if you shut them down, they'll never, they'll never bring forth anything again. And they might have, they might find something legit, but if you shut them down immediately, they're going to go, well, fuck it. Then if they don't want to fix the program, why do I? Yes. Um, so take notes and then assess what they've said and scratch out, scratch out the, the, the break room doesn't have the right energy drink that I like. Oh, but hey, we have uh, X amount of work coming up and only a quarter of the tooling to be able to complete it. Ooh, that's a that's a one I should probably look at. Yes. You right. know. That's that's a very good point. To all all of it, all of it. I love it all. And I was gonna say, hey, you want to summarize this all into like a final point because that that was very I what I was how did, what did I say? That was very informative. And it's something that we all should take away from it. And you want, can you, can you summarize that again for me, man? So we can all just like have this as a, as a key takeaway from today. Oh, <laughs> uh, oh, I kind of just did. Oh, you but, uh, <laughs> but uh, Never mind. I'll just say, uh, you know, proactivity, uh, being proactive is a double edged sword. Um, Identify the risk, identify issues, be tactful in your, in your delivery and in the reception of those. And then address, you know, address together as a unit, as a team to make, to make your area of operation better. Very well said, man. I love it. <laughs> kind of put you on the spot there, but you was, it was so good. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. I'm trying to, I'm trying to record this in my mind. As you're saying it, because it, because <laughs> it, because it, it, it is, it's true. And yep. you would think like, how does this apply to me as a line mech or as a regular technician or as a general aviation tech? Like, well, it applies for this many reasons because you never know what these may apply to, and should you ever have to use any of these uh, uh, techniques, especially what MVP was alluding to, it's going to help in the long run when you know who your audience is what you're trying to prevent and just know that if you try to prevent too much, you end up inducing problems. So uh, on that, on that note, let us know what you guys uh, think. Like, 
is it possible to be over preemptive or over proactive? And have you ever experienced times when you were being proactive and you got shut down because you just didn't have the, for lack of better word, clout within the workspace to send that message forward? Let us know on, on all our social medias and our comments. Well, and yeah. And then what did you do? Did you just quit or did you reevaluate your, your attack, um, your attack pattern, re-strategize and approach from a different angle? What did you do to get your word across if that's what you did? Yes. And then what was the result of it? Right. Please let us know. And if it's an ongoing thing, we definitely want to know, too, because maybe this is uh, something that needs to get brought up. So for everyone's awareness, right, like this is happening in shop A, maybe it's happening on shop B and C, too. Who knows? But it's a good way to, to let us all know. And so we can all learn together. By all means, let us know again in the comments or in our emails or however much you, or whatever way is easiest for you to get a hold of us. Please and thank you. <laughs> um, that note, thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. We'd like to take this time to thank our patrons for supporting our show and allowing us to continue to make episodes, maintain our gear, and create merch for all of our listeners with special thanks to Erica Lamont, Chris Hawkins, Ryan Freshour, Dan Schubert, Jenny Dignan, and the ladies of the Dick Talk and Mimosas podcast. Thank you all so much for your support and patronage. Visit our shop at cancelformaintenance.com and grab some swag to show off both your support for us and your prowess as an aircraft technician. If you have ideas for the show or you'd like to be a guest on the show, visit our contact us section and send us a line. We will do what we can to get your ideas or yourself on the show. You can also follow us on social media such as on Facebook at Cancel for Maintenance, Instagram at Kanks, that's C-A-N-X for Maintenance Podcast, or on Twitter at CXMX Podcast. Check out some of our affiliates like Rockwell Time, where they make both rugged and classy watches to fit your lifestyle. Use the code CX4MX and save 10% off your purchase. Support us on Patreon. Our patrons get exclusive perks such as access to our Discord, discounts and early access to merch, special patron-only episodes, and so much more. Thank you again so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.